am delighted to be joined by Kenny Hickey of Typo Negative. Mate, we're going to talk all Typo very soon. But I want to talk to you a little bit about what you've got going on at the moment before we do all of that with Silver Tomb. Um, it's been cool having your music back out there and you putting art back in, into the world. Um, how has it been being back in the groove with Silver Tomb and what's been your your biggest takeaway from the early part of the band? Um, well, this whole, you know, the whole COVID thing kind of really like put everything on the shelf, right? When it was starting to get moving, you know, we were supposed to open up for a tour with Monster Magnet all in the States starting in, uh, I think, I think it was March. Yeah. Like the first week of March or something like that. And that's right when everything shut down, you know, but, uh, that was kind of a bomb out, you know, and it's been a long time. Um, I still absolutely love performing live, you know. I mean, the traveling, I'm over. You know, I've already yeah, done fair. enough traveling in my life. But uh, I can't live without it, you know. I'm going to, I, I got to, uh, I got to perform. I got to connect with people, you know. So um, it's been a positive experience, you know. I can't I report anything negative yet, but we haven't done a whole lot, you know. We did yeah. uh, a couple of shows here and there, some local shows, which were great. You know, we uh, did a short run with Life of Agony in 2018. And uh, it's just great being out there again, you know, having some music out there and moving forward, For real. something new. For real. And creatively, during this lockdown, because you had the rug pulled out from under you, like just as Silver Tomb was about to, like I was really looking forward to that tour with Monster Magnet doing Power Trip in full. That was going to be a good time as far as I'm concerned. Um, Hopefully when... it's going to happen. It'll end up happening. You know, oh, glad to, oh, glad to hear that. That's fucking yeah. great news. Um, but what have you been doing to stay, have you been staying creative during this lockdown or has it just been a case of, ah, fuck it? Oh, no, 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 no. I've been more creative than ever. I mean, I got more time, more time than ever, you know what I mean? So, uh, I've been like slowly piecing together a studio, building, building some great stuff in my studio, some great stuff to record with. And at the same time, I've written an entire, another album. So, um, recording basic tracks for that. Holy shit. Right now, I'm moving forward. Um, also, we um, have an animator that's doing a video for us for the for uh, the song So True from the first record, which uh, is taking some time. You know, animation takes some time. It's five and a half minutes yeah. of animation. But um, the storyline is great. It's really cool. It's really dark. And I can't wait for that to come out. We're hoping sometime in November. So... We are here because the After Dark documentary is something that we're going to be playing. But I want to take you on a bit of a bit of a journey through the discography of Typo Negative. Um, I, I've been lucky to interview most of your band over the years, mm-hmm. and uh, I've never you had the little, chance. You look a little too young for that. I know. I'm 37. I hide it well, mate. <laughs> What were you, like 12 when you started interviewing us? Yeah, I, mate, I started when I was 18. I interviewed, I, in fact, I'll, I'll tell the story. I interviewed Pete in a toilet cubicle, right? It was on World Coming Day. It well, was well, on... That's, that's where he spent 90% of his time. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was it, like he insisted. And I, you probably can't tell because I'm sat down, but I'm like 5'6". So it was one of the most surreal experiences of all of my years of doing this. Well, maybe I should go over to the toilet right now. You want to do this to the toilet? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we should. <laughs> so I, I've never been lucky enough, though, to sit and talk full discography. But this is fucking amazing. Kenny, you've okay. made my day. <laughs> over to the toilet we go. I love it, mate. I love it. This is sensational. Um, so I'll start by asking... Everyone knows Bloody Kisses and the the debut and the story and <laughs> all of the things. Should this I, is should so. I, should I pull my pants down? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a family show, Kenny. <laughs> uh, some sound effects. Mate, you are an absolute legend. This is so sick. I love that it's all come 360. I wanted to ask you a bit actually about life before. Roadrunner Records and life before Monty turning up and all of those kind of things. You have such a, a unique sound, but it was one that felt fully realised when we all heard Bloody Kisses. What was life like playing clubs and things like that 
before being signed for Typo Negative and this music kind of becoming what we heard fully formed on Bloody Kisses? Um, it was... I mean, Peter had somewhat of a following from uh, his carnivore days. So mm. we, we had... But the thing was, is that we were, we were doing this um, hardcore dirge um, industrial thing that nobody had ever heard before. I mean, nobody had really ever done it to the extent that we did it, you know. And um, at the first few shows, we had probably, I would say, maybe 100 skinheads show up that were expecting to hear, you know, carnivore. And, you know, we were playing 20-minute dirges. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, were like, we had this one song called Screwdriver where we would just yeah. feed back on stage with screwdrivers, me and Peter, and scrape it along. <laughs> And then bang on it. We do that for like 15, 20 minutes. And they just really, to tell you the truth, looked at us like we were nuts. Didn't really get it. They got into fights, you know. And, and as soon as the fast part came, they get into the mosh pits, start beating each other up. That's all they really knew how to relate to it, you know. Yeah. So it was kind of strange. It was kind of a square peg trying to fit into some, any hole. And uh, it took a while. It, took, it didn't take too long. It took about a month or two months, you know. I, what really started making the band catch on before we got signed was we finished the first demo under the name repulsion it wasn't even it wasn't even top on other yet mm. so we, we recorded the demo at a local uh, place called systems two and put it put cassettes out and we handed them out at shows we went to shows handed them out and it caught on word of mouth you know people you know were like what is this insane stuff you know and um, are these guys serious they can't be serious of course we weren't it started building up slowly you know? the thing that makes it even more fascinating is that it's done in New York City where people are not backwards in coming forwards to tell you exactly what they think so being, you know, being unique in most places is one thing being unique in New York is quite another um, did you feel like people got it pretty soon after you had had that month or two months to to define the sound? I think that in the, in the slow, deep and hard days, the stuff was so extreme that you had to either get it or you didn't. You didn't show up. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So the people, yeah, we got a lot of weirdos. We, had, we were able to pack a good amount of weirdos into a room. <laughs> slow, deep and hard, you know? People are, you know, that extreme tastes. You know, and then it was, you know, hyper intelligent people that got the sarcasm and stuff like that. So we got this mix of like of geek skinheads and, you know, and, and just, you know, misanthropes. And um, it didn't really start crossing over until Bloody Kisses later. I guess we'll get to that later. But where we started getting into a crowd that didn't get it. Mm. Where people were into goth, metal, rock, just thought we were a rock band, you know. So yeah. then we, we just ended up, we didn't lose the original nuts. We just threw new nuts yeah. on top of them so it was always like a mixed bag of nuts for us yeah and, and so i was only like eight or nine when the whole never mind thing happened right but there's the perpetual myth within rock music is that uh nirvana blew the doors open and freaks then ran the asylum for five years which i can understand from the perspective of when you look at fucking ministry and uh, and yourselves and primus and fucking yeah. like weird bands went platinum um how much do you attribute to that the fucking be it the, the melvins or the alternative rock scene changing how people viewed heavier music how much of what happened with Bloody Kisses going supernova? Do you attribute to that landscape shift culturally? I think uh, a lot. I think that it had brewing since been brewing since you know 1984. You know, since Jane's Addiction and you know the Sound Gardens and the bands that were like sick of seeing you know hair bands. You know these bullshit West Coast hair bands. You know, I mean, I was never into that. I, I was never a Cinderella fan. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, God bless them. You know, yeah, they yeah, yeah. They're, they're historical. Bands. I like Gypsy Road as much as the next man, but I hear you. Listen, I'm not even going to put down the movement. Let's just say it was it was raining high for too long. You know, yeah. something had to take it down. You know, and um. People were just going for anything that was counterculture of that, you know, of, of, you know, super glam and showing off and you know, everything larger than life. And it went down to, you know, dirty sweaters and greasy hair, you know, it went back to that, you know, which yeah. you know, for me, it was refreshing because I loved it. I love 
grunge. I love the music that, that that exploded out of that. I love Jane's Addiction, you know, before they were big, you know. So we were all leading up to this, even Nine Inch Nails, you know. So, yeah, you know, I agree. Trent, Trent was actually a fan of Slow Deacon Heart. That's why he asked us to come out and do his, uh, our first tour with him was like two weeks in theaters on the West Coast. It was like 1991 or something like that. So I think that um, and, uh, bands uh, like Smashing Pumpkins too. You know, I know Billy Corgan was aware of the band. He came down to see us once when, when we actually played Chicago. Hung out with me backstage. Came yeah. in. Said, oh, you must be uh, the rest of the guys. You got that thousand mile stare in your eyes. We were like, <laughs> like time for like nineteen months, you know. And he was, I was like, you want a beer? He goes, no, but can I have an apple? It's Billy Corgan. <laughs> <laughs> Superb. I love, I love, I love that you say Billy as well because I feel like he sometimes gets left out of that conversation. He's always been a champion for outsider art as well. Did you oh, feel man. like? Did you feel like outsiders though, man? Always, I still do. You know, I mean, we're always like this weird outside the uh, periphery band, you know. And I, I think that's, you know, it's a reflection on our personalities and it's where we belong, you know. Mm. Uh, and I, I, I know the answer. Like, I would never dream of saying, like, oh, uh, were you ever tempted to be more linear? Because I know the answer to that. Um, but was being weird a conscious choice? Like, the first time that I heard um, Black Number One and it's got the, the Adams Family keys run and things like that, blew my skirt over my head. Like, I fucking... That's I love hearing things that catch me off guard, and I love things that excite me in a in a off kilter way. Um, was there ever was there ever a time that you kind of shrugged and thought fitted in might work for typo? Um, I thought it would never work. Everything would nothing. None of it would work right from the start. You know, I thought it was. This is crazy, you know. From the first notes that Peter ever played me, I said, what the, are you serious? You know? So I always had, kind of felt like nobody would get it. And then, like, I think um, we just got lucky where, you know, enough people got it and enough people didn't get it. But there was something for everyone to like in it, you know. I mean, even like you mentioned Black Number One, there's a lot of campy humor in that, which is, you know, obviously what we were going for, you know. Mm. And some people think we were actually serious, you know. Some people then- really think we're vampires. <laughs> did you did you did you fucking love that though did you love that like that that you were so that even people that liked you might not have got what you were putting out like uh, to me when you my just, favorite just, part just that look was at my favorite part of it. look at the t-shirt see the drab four see like you, you know yeah. see that kind of thing was it did, did you feel like even your own fans got you a lot of the time or some of the time Got some it. of them got some, some of the time. Some of them you know, laughed at the stuff that wasn't supposed to be funny and then, you know, cried at the stuff that was supposed to be funny, you know. But uh-huh. uh, a lot of that was deliberate. Yeah. yeah. Let's let's go down that rabbit hole then, because there's some fascinating records that take some fascinating turns. We'll start with Bloody Kisses. Um, lightning in a Bottle... Um, did it have to happen at that point in time? Like, if Typo, if, if Bloody Kisses had to come out three years later, do you think it would have still enjoyed the success that it did? Three years, yeah, maybe. Five or ten, probably not. I mean, it's still like, it's still an oddball record. I mean, even when it came out, it was an oddball record. It really didn't fit in in any genre. There's so many genres in it, you know. So I, at that point in time, the band was still had hardcore elements it had some you know some goth camp metal in you know elements in it it had a lot of different eclectic stuff on it still like because it didn't really become as linear as which later on october wrestling you know. so we sort of fit everywhere but didn't fit anywhere yeah i, I know what you're saying like when i'd see the di- like a, a bill like a dynamo festival like where else would typo play but you would look at the lineup of bands and be like they're still not like anyone. The, yeah. How do you feel about bands that have that in their DNA today? Like I saw you, you guys do the chat with Code Orange, right? And yeah, Code, yeah, yeah. Or- Code Orange are a band that are out there and are challenging the status quo. But mm-hmm. like, 
in the way that it felt possible for Typo to go over the top and be platinum, because you had all of these examples of it happening, right? Mm -hmm. When you look at today's, like, land swell, do you feel for a band like that today, or what is your take on that? I mean, I feel for a band like that at any time, in the early days, because it's always the hard route, you know? That's the hardest route. If, if you're, uh, if you're not following the status quo, you know, it's an uphill battle all the way. So, and a lot of times bands like that are influential. They don't really ever cash in and make the big money day. You know, they influence a lot of other bands, you know? Yeah. And then, you know, and when they're 80, they end up living in a one room occupancy with no windows. <laughs> did, you, did you ever feel like people tried to water down Typo and make it more palatable? Oh, they tried over the years, yeah. You know, I think in, to some degree, we might have even tried at one point or another, but failed at it because we were incapable of it. That's interesting. What point would you say that is? Well, I, you know, right before um, the making of October Russ, uh, the president of the company, Case Russell, was like, I need singles, radio singles. Because obviously, you know, we were making 12, 13 minute songs on Bloody Kisses, and it had to be edited down, somehow made into some kind of uh, single, which we did have. You know, Christian Woman was a successful single. Mm. So, really, by the law, by and large, October Russ was Peter's shot at making radio signals. The laughter between us tells its own story. <laughs> so, you know, I always said, Peter, you know, you're amazing, you're brilliant, but you can't write a simple song, dude. <laughs> dude do you want to... You know, um, yeah. I don't want to be me was actually his answer to that when I, I told him that at some point. Yeah, you know, the song I don't want to be me. Yeah, of course, yeah. Attempt to write a simple song, which I think he actually yeah. succeeded. Yeah, that's that's pedal to the metal and you know, there's not much of the weirdness in uh, there. But Peter had to force himself into that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing that fascinates me, like listening to you say that about October Rust in particular, is because Bloody Kisses is so fucking eclectic. Like, it bounces you off so many different walls for that reason. Um, do you feel like uh, October Rust had a theme? And if October Rust had a theme, what was it? Um, it was very, I would say, romantic. Like, sexy, dark, romantic, you know? And uh, it kept, it was, it really kept its theme throughout, you know? It wasn't drawn from 18 different places like the previous three records so i think in a way you know it's a piece of art in its own you know i think in the long term stands up but i think that um people didn't know what to think of it when it came out mm. it took a while you know it took a while to uh to catch on and sell and, and go platinum i've had this i've had this conversation with various there's a there's a handful of bands that I believe can sit in the same basket of experience with Typo. I've had this chat with Vila from him before, and that's when your music has an effect. I think October Rust has an effeminate energy to it, um, and I think that was re reflected in like I know more girls that like Typo than like most bands, yes. right? Where was that energy, and like, what caused that? What, like, was it that? Was it that? Was, was it Peter's, that feel of? It was Peter revealing his his romantic side, his desires, you know, and he just let it all out. And he he knew he, he was a smart guy. He knew damn well it would draw in a lot of females, and it did. Hmm. <laughs> it, it worked. Yeah. But at the same time, I think you know, in his outlook and his fantasies and stuff like that, in the lyrics that are real, he was being honest, you know. Hmm. And then there was the tongue and cheese stuff, like Wolf Moon. Yeah. yeah the comedy element was always there, no matter what. We never took it ourselves 100% seriously, obviously. <sighs> but I think that um, Bloody Kisses was the breakout album, you know, and the most widespread one. And I think Bloody Kisses had a lot to offer for a lot of different people, you know, a big, larger cross section. And I think mm. that when. When October Rust came out, which was a brilliant record, it was more designed for a smaller, more specific audience. You know, mm. it was more. I guess you could put it on the genre of goth metal. You know, mm. uh, and uh, you spoke about 
Peter's authenticity there. Um, World Coming Down being the next record was an uncomfortable listen if you were really paying attention. Now, where's humour and where's reality when it comes to World Coming Down? Because it felt like World Coming Down was... I love the record. I think it's criminal. It's I think it's, my it's, favorite, fucking, it's one of my favorite records. It's criminally underrated. But I can't, I can't listen to it, though. It's so dark and, like, it's so prophetic. Like, All those lyrics came true. Yeah. yeah. Was it was it humor at the time or was it reality at that time as well? Oh, it was absolutely reality. You know, at the time, um, we had, or it was this, this is our fourth record, right? So... Mm -hmm. Fifth record. Well, it's really the fifth fifth record. But at the time, we have done a lot of touring. You know, uh, we went through a lot. Um, addictions had taken their hold. Shit was crumbling. The infrastructure was starting to crumble, and we were physically and mentally starting to crumble. And I remember Peter being like, <clears throat> I have nothing left to write about. You know, that's it. I'm done. You know, I got nothing to complain. I got nothing to write about. I said, look at this shit you're going through right now. Are you kidding me? Just tell the truth. And he did. And he tell it black and white and grim. It's a brilliant record. But it is a difficult listen. You know, but you got to really listen to it lyrically. Yeah. And, I mean, musically, it's brilliant, too. It's like, just, it's, it just, it's so bizarre to me that, that a band that have always made Bleak their own, when they truly, like, took bleak to its nth dimension did you feel like you lost people on world coming down um no i feel like that we lost people somewhere in between bloody kisses and, and world coming down like it was already things the the environment was already changing you know new metal was exploding you know there was all kinds of other stuff going on you know so um you know, Slipknot was taken off. Now they were the hugest band. You know, I remember when yeah. I met Slipknot, we, we played Iowa, like, years ago, okay? We, yeah. Uh, and, like, in the winter, right? And, you know, I was drunk and annoyed. I just, you know, I was waiting to go on, and this little kid comes up to me. It must have been, you know, a of guys. He's like, hey, man, we're label mates now! They were opening up for us. I didn't even know, I never even heard of them. Yeah. You just signed a roadrunner. I said, oh, yeah, get away from me, kid. You're bothering me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, you know they've become the hugest band in yeah. the world. You know? <laughs> so by the time World Coming Down was being written and done, you know, Slipknot was exploding and they were the biggest focus in Roadrunner, you know, I mean, yeah, obviously, man. you know, so like things were changing. So, you know, and we came out with this gigantically doom, you know, suicidal record. You know, that's hard yeah. to sell in any climate. You know what I mean? That's yeah. hard to sell in any climate, you know? So I think that by that time, the periphery fans were weeded out, and it was just the hardcore fan base left, which was quite large still. So, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. We still yeah, had yeah, a career. Real. We still had a career. We just, you know, we were, you know, on top 40, obviously. Uh, what was your time? So, what was the feeling inside the band when new metal was happening? Like you, you would have been discussing this shit as it was happening. Like as the world. Oh, I became... remember. Watch it, wait, wait, we're at we're at Ozfest and Corn was opening up. Okay, it was a nice guys too. Uh, yeah, um, played them a long time. But this is before we even knew them. And me, Peter, and Johnny are in the audience. Johnny tells a story like, and Corn's on stage, and we're watching him, and and Peter goes to Johnny. What do you think of these guys? Johnny goes, ah, you'll never hear of them again in six months. <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> I saw him headline a festival to 80,000 people like two years ago. <laughs> so, you know, you, you learn. You live and learn. You come to know. Yeah. You never know. I mean, it's this little annoying kid you meet backstage and ends up, you know, running the business in five years. You know. Wild, so, wild game. What's your take? Up. What's your take on the reverence of Typo in 2020? Because there has been, like, a... Fucking a gathering, a gathering. This last decade, as someone that's liked your band since since I heard you, like watching the 
the social media outpouring that happens a couple of times a year and the fact that I see people using, like I can't see someone using the green heart emoji yeah, without, yeah. without linking it to typo negative. That's a fucking amazing thing to be saying in 2020. Like, what's your take on that? Was it the time caught up with typo? What's... Well, it's two what, things. What you, okay. I mean, if you made some kind of mark in music, you know, you hit your peak. Then you get rejected by the new, right? They all treat you like a redheaded stepchild mm -hmm. for about 10 years. And you have your resurgence. People look back and say, oh, wait, this was actually a great fan. And then, you know, you could have that for a small amount of time and go away again. But I think that typo was actually transcended. And we've actually influenced a lot of a lot of the musicians now, you know, a lot of the younger musicians and stuff. So we have found some form of longevity and transcendence through just influencing other artists, I think more yeah. than anything else. I, I would like to say as well that I have ne never, ever, ever in my life met someone that hyper, that, that half-heartedly likes typo negative. Like, I've never met the, the guy or girl that's like, yeah, typo are all right. The people, no. that, the people that like typo are like, I want Pete's face tattooed on my face yeah, yeah. And, oh, my, and, 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 my, and my name's Linda. Like, like... And like, then other people are like, you mean those vampire assholes? Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> like, do, do you feel like... Is it kind of bittersweet, this resurgence? Because... Everything in Typo was bittersweet right from the very beginning. You know what I mean? It was... I would, we never got anything sweet. That wasn't sour at the same time. I mean, I could prob probably a lot of musicians in the world could say the same thing about their careers, but it was especially mm. so with this band. You know, uh, so it's it's not it's this is sweet. Yeah, it's bittersweet. Of course it is because it's over. You get reminded. Yeah, we got a resurgence. People are doing covers if I don't want to be me and this stuff and stuff like that. But then it's also remind I'm reminded of you know I got to do interviews and stuff like I did an interview the other day and I wanted to talk about bloody kisses and the making of it. I'm like. It was 27 years ago. I don't remember shit. Yeah. I, I was calling Josh. He doesn't remember anything. And I, I had to listen to the record, which I haven't done in decades, from beginning to end. And it depressed me. You know, I got a little depressed. I do with joyful memories, but, like, it brings back a lot of great memories. And, you know, you, you can't live in the past. You have to, you have to go forward. And if, if I think about it too much, it gets me depressed. So. Yeah. All right. But, Last... um, at the same time, it's sweet. You know, it's great. You know, it's great to have people have reverence for the band and, and for it to keep, keep having energy and power. There's one more question for you then, man, about specifically. So um, After Dark is being streamed uh, by us at NotFest. And that means that there is a whole wave of people that are going to be exposed to typo negative maybe for the first time or certainly does peter like, actually expose himself in that i think he does at one point uh, that have blurred it i'm sure <laughs> it's on the street or something <laughs> well there's a lot of blurring for people to do the like the blur line <laughs> is pretty fucking long um what's it uh, like is it still exciting to you that something like this gets to happen that after Dark can be put in front of an audience that are here and like waiting for heavy content, and there's shit. There's a whole generation of people to freak out again. Is that is that an exciting thing for you, or is it, or, or does it, or does that go against the you can't live in the past ethos? Well, when you look at some of the content in in, in, in um, that video, it's it's kind of makes you kind of vulnerable. <laughs> you know, more than exciting. <laughs> but uh, it's cool that people, you know, they want to see it. You know, there's still there's still a call for it. But you know, uh, I'm not gonna like sit with the streaming and watch people comments and stuff like yeah. that because I don't want to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, Kenny. Oh, Kenny, going, look at this asshole. You know? <laughs> Mate, it's a fucking honour to have spent half an hour chatting to you today, man. Uh, the After Dark stream happens on NotFest.com next week. Um, Next time you've got anything going on with Silver Tomb or anything, I'll hit Mark up and we'll do this again anytime you've got anything going on, mate. Thank you, buddy. All the best. And thank you so much for doing that on, on the crapper. It's, it's the typo experience I wanted to follow up with, Kenny. All the best, man. I'll see you soon.
All right, bro. Take it Cheers, easy. mate. Bye. Get to like and share this video and join me on Twitch every Tuesday, Friday, and Saturday for guest hangouts, new music votes, tier lists, band specific competitions, weekly merch roundups, and much, much more. That's twitch.tv forward slash mosh talks. Find the link in the description below. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel, and I'll see you on notfest.com for all of the latest news, features, and much more from the world of rock, metal and beyond.